Hi everyone, Dr. Amy here. I'm a pediatrician with Kinder. It's been a few scary and confusing weeks for all of us. Now, like you, I've been trying to read everything I can about the coronavirus and COVID-19 situation around the world as it develops. I understand that we're all concerned and sometimes the information has been a little bit unclear. And there's been some misinformation out there as well that has not been helpful. So I thought today, let's sit down and talk about what we know as of right now, the middle of March, about COVID-19, uh, specifically how it's affecting the world in the United States, and what we can do from here on out, and why it's important to take the precautions that we're taking. I want to answer some common questions, especially from a pediatric perspective about children and how it affects them, as well as the rest of your family. Now, as a doctor, I like to take an evidence-based approach. Not only is that my training, but as part of my responsibility towards uh, the information I put out there as a doctor. But this is a quickly evolving situation and we learn something new every day. I'm gonna do my best to stick to data and evidence that we know of as of today. And as we learn more, I hope to be able to share those updates with you as well, especially if it affects our recommendations. Now, coronaviruses are a family of common viruses that affect mammals and birds. And most of the time, and most of the strains cause pretty mild symptoms like a common cold, fever, cough, runny nose, the things that we're used to. Now, every once in a while, we can have a strain that is new and or particularly lethal, and that can spread through the world quickly and with more bad outcomes. Prior examples of this would include the SARS epidemic, which is not exactly the same as COVID-19 as we're experiencing, but some of the same features apply in that it is a coronavirus. It is a new strain that we have not experienced before and it's spreading very rapidly. So our world at large is full of viruses every day. And since we come into contact with them since birth, there's what's called herd immunity, which means most of us have developed some level of um, recognition with our immune system to the common viruses, which is why we still get sick with colds and um, influenza is another virus. But these illnesses tend to not overtake our healthcare system because people don't get sick all at once and most of us are not getting very sick. But when a new virus, such as the one causing COVID-19 right now, appears in the world, because we have no herd immunity to it, it can spread very quickly and it takes a while for that herd immunity to catch up. If we want to look specifically at how a virus is spreading through the world and affecting populations, we need to look at how quickly or how widespread it is and also how lethal it is. The two don't always go together. In fact, they're independent factors. So coronavirus so far is making a big impact because of how widespread it is due to how easily and how quickly it can spread through our community. As for how lethal it is and how that affects our healthcare system, we'll look at it in a later video. But right now, let's just talk about how it's spreading and why the timeline matters. So the WHO has declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. This is a public health concept that means a virus or an illness actually uh, that is spreading in separate areas of the world concurrently. Now remember this term only describes how prevalent and widespread it is. It does not describe how lethal it is. So why is the current coronavirus causing COVID-19 so good at spreading? One, like we talked about, there's no herd immunity. So as it spreads, none of us have encountered it before. Our bodies are not preparing and cannot fight off the virus very quickly. And secondly, because it's actually not that lethal, because 80% of people who have it have either very mild symptoms or no symptoms. And even those who go on to develop symptoms can have a very long latent period of up to 10 days where they are contagious but not showing symptoms. This is very different from something like Ebola virus where by the time you have it and you're contagious, the symptoms are very dramatic and it's we know for sure who has it. But with coronavirus, most people spend a long time able to pass the virus around without either knowing it or with very mild symptoms. There's almost no way to completely shut down the spreading of this virus without pretty dramatic measures to contain people in such a highly mobile, moving around kind of world that we have, just because we don't know who's sick, especially in the earlier parts of the epidemic. And that's why we're seeing countries one by one taking pretty dramatic shutdowns, whether they appear sick or not. And lastly, the spread is also because we're pretty late to the game. Wuhan in China has been dealing with this virus for weeks, even months before the world knew about it and before actual quarantine containment measures were 
taken place. Along with China being such a populous country that's very mobile, a destination and also a lot of travelers coming in and out, we started late in the game of containing this virus and the world has been playing catch up ever since. Now, why is it such a big problem that is so widespread? Because I just said 80% of people have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. In the next video, we'll break down who exactly are at risk. But for now, let's look at why it's such a big problem. Now, we know aside from the 80% of people who are fine and can recover easily on their own, 15% will probably need hospital care and 5% likely needs ICU level critical care. Of course, most of the vulnerable population are the elderly or people who are already sick. But the fact that it spreads quickly means that the 5% that needs intensive care will need it very quickly and in a concentrated period of time. Now, the flu also puts a percentage of people in critical conditions and leads to death, in, especially in the vulnerable populations. But if you look at flu season around the world, it is a six month period of time. Now, our hospitals and personnel are considered limited resources the respiratory machines that we need to support people and the doctors to see them. While it might be able to support people periodically needing it over a six month period of time, given the fast concentrated spike of critical patients with coronavirus, the systems can get overwhelmed like we've seen in Italy and China. So the 5% that need critical care might not have the personnel, the doctors, uh, the vents and the infrastructure to help them through the worst of the illness. That's why for COVID-19, the delayed response and also the difficulty in containing a virus that spreads quickly through healthy people has been the crux of the problem. Now in the next video in the series, let's look at who exactly is vulnerable, how does testing work, as well as the problems that we've had with testing, and then how does that affect treatment or what we know about treatment so far.